We're in Neighbors and Nations, season two. This portion of it's called To Infinity and Beyond because the gospel is spreading throughout the known world in dramatic ways. And uh, today's text, if you read ahead, which we try to get everybody to do on a regular basis, just read ahead so you know where we're at and kind of be tracking with what's on the menu for the day. And uh, you, you recognize that this, is, this has got to be one of the most bizarre scenes in all of the Bible, right? It's a crazy scene. And so, but it's not random. It's not like, now remember, Luke is the author, the human author here. He wrote the Gospel of Luke and he wrote the, uh, the Acts of the Apostles and kind of a, a two-part history of the life and ministry of Christ, both while he was on earth and then uh, after he left with uh, sending his spirit and carrying out his work through the people of God, uh, the, the, the early church, and that's continuing even to our day right here, right this minute. Uh, but Luke doesn't just include things um, because they're crazy or because they're fantastic or simply because he likes them. He's always purposeful about including uh, in the text, what he's included. So, so when we read this today, we got to know that there's a reason for it. There's something. There's a there's a truth that we need to grasp, a reality uh, that we need to understand and absorb, uh, because it's really important for our um, our ability to be faithful as we walk with Christ. And so, let's keep that in mind. Now. Uh, you'll notice, if, as we left off last week, Paul is in Ephesus, and he left the synagogue after he was being berated for uh, preaching uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ being Messiah. He goes over to the hall of Tyrannus, who was, his, this was a place, kind of a place where public meetings could be held, and he's, he's there for two years sharing the word of the Lord, sharing the gospel message, spreading the gospel message from there for a two-year period. So it's a significant amount of time, but Ephesus is a, Ephesus is kind of a major hub in Asia Minor there. It's a major city in that. And so it's that, it's that kind of that place in that region that's going to be the launch pad for the gospel to go out all over the place. And what we find in, in this is as we study this text is that Luke is using a particular tactic We'll call it the sandwich tactic. Um, it has nothing to do with ham and cheese, um, even though we like ham and cheese. But, um, but in, in verse 10, it says that this continued on, Paul sharing the gospel from the hall of Tyrannus for two years. And notice it says, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Okay? So all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord. So that's how he end. that's how... He ends verse 10, that's how he ends kind of that section, and then he's moving into this crazy scene that we're going to see, and then he ends the crazy scene in verse 20 with saying this, so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Now we've got to, as students of the Bible, we've got to pay attention to things like that. He ends one one section with, so all the residents heard the word of the Lord. So think about this, the, all the residents of Asia. Now, this is Asia Minor, north of the Mediterranean Sea. Ephesus is a major city in that hub. Ephesus is a pretty large city by ancient you know, uh, uh, standards. It's about 250,000 people, roughly, that lived there, and then all the surrounding little villages and towns and such. And so this is, th- th- this is quite a significant statement that all of the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord. That's a pretty spectacular spreading of the gospel message in that world without social media, without the internet. This is word of mouth, people walking to where they were going to be. It's pretty significant that, that, that Luke would say all of Asia has now become familiar with the gospel message. Okay? And then he, we get through our text today and he ends it with a, a similar phrase, but it's a building on. So the word of the Lord continued to increase. To increase there means to be widespread. It continued to spread widely and prevail mightily. So he, so he shares this kind of sandwich effect about the word of the Lord being heard and the word of the Lord prevailing. And so we've got to understand that that's not an accident. He did that on purpose. He's an intelligent writer. And it's what he says in between that, which is our text today, that is the significant thing that we need to get. 
but we, we know that somehow it has to do something with the word of the Lord because he's used this sandwich tactic, right? You follow so far? So let's read it, and um, let's, see how we, let's see how we do. We'll read the whole text here. It says, starting in verse 11, And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Siva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize. But who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit, in the man in whom was the evil spirit, leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon all of them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers became confessing and divulging their practices, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver, so, the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Kind of a crazy scene, huh? I mean, if you, if you picture this going on, it's like, wow, that's pretty dramatic. All three sections of it where Paul's doing these, God is doing these miraculous things, and then we've got this cr- crazy scene with these, the Jewish itinerant exorcists. It's like, is this an alternative rock band, or who are these people? We don't know. And then, of course, what, what takes place as a response to this uh, among the believers as they're learning what it means to follow Jesus. And so this is quite a crazy, quite a crazy scene. I, I found this little picture up here. This is actually a painting, a very, a very famous painting. Hard to see from here, but this is uh, it's a French artist. And I'm not French, and I, I cannot say their names. And if I tried, it would sound really stupid. So I'm, it's just a French artist. And if you know who it is, congratulations. But this kind of a crazy scene, right, where they're burning these books and, and such, and this is the Apostle Paul preaching. But, um, but, but what we have here, so we've got this situation where, and we recognize that, that humans, I mean, from the very beginning, seems like uh, ancient days, there's been this, this, this intrigue into spiritual forces, that there's kind of an innate understanding. There's something within us that recognizes that that the 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 visual and the material isn't all there is in this world. That there is something beyond the physical world. There's this spirit, spiritual world. There's this something. There's just something there, and there's an intrigue. Uh, a lot of people are very intrigued by this, and that's certainly what we see in Ephesus. Ephesus was kind of the the center of this occult practice within the Roman Empire. It was it was common throughout the Roman Empire, but it had kind of its it kind of had its epicenter in Ephesus here. And so people, people f- f- for the, almost like the history of humanity have, have, um, have not just been intrigued by the spirit world, by the, by the possibility of good forces and evil forces, and what do we do with all of this? And, and in our day, of course, there's, there's kind of a couple of different camps. There's this lot of people who would recognize it, say, yes, we believe in that. And then there's this whole other side of of people, especially in America, maybe that would say, that's all bogus, that's all superstition, and there's nothing to it or anything like that. And so we're, we would want to land squarely on, what, what does the Bible say about this? And so we'll deal with this as, as we get into this text, but people have always seemed to seek guidance to receive, you know, the favor of, of the gods, if you will, lowercase g. And, um, and so all of this sort of activity is uh, our text calls it magic arts, another word that's known in our world today is the occult. All of this activity is known as that, the practice of the magic arts, something that was exceptionally common in Ephesus. It, it, it's this idea that they were, they were regularly 
trying to secure the favor of the gods, to secure health and to secure blessing and protection and favor and, and to seek happiness. And all of those things were very much a part of their world. They used spells and incantations and they'd recite them often to try to get this stuff to take place. And there's a good deal of this activity in our world uh, even, even now. And so it's kind of, a, kind of funny. I like to... Um, I don't like to run outside very much, so I run on my treadmill in my garage, and I because I have a TV out there, so I can watch TV and wa- and I can and I can run on my treadmill. So I'm running yesterday, and I see this this ad comes up um, on this commercial for this so- a psychic hot- hotline, and I was like, wow, here, how about this? I'm going to talk about this tomorrow because it, I mean, there's, all these people are giving their personal testimonies about it was so easy. I felt so welcome. It was so warm and friendly. And the insight that I gained from this and the person on the other line, on the other end of the line was just so helpful to me. And I, I got all of the information. It was just like, really, you could see if you didn't have a biblical understanding of what those occult practices are and what's going on there, you could think, man, what, why wouldn't I do this? Why wouldn't I pay a dollar per minute to talk with somebody who says they're a psychic if I could find that sense of, uh, of information I'm seeking and, 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 and um, you know, the, 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 the news I want to hear and, and all, of that sort of, all of that sort of thing. Seeking, just as people have always done, looking for happiness, looking for health, looking for success, looking to know what's going to happen in the future, all of those things, big, big stuff in our world. And so all of this sort of activity... And I, I'll give you a list, but it's not an exhaustive list. It's not a comprehensive list, but of the things that we see in our world. Astrology would find its way part as a part of the occult or magic arts. Sorcery, witchcraft, horoscopes, New Age, tarot cards, fortune telling, channeling, Ouija boards, divination, clairvoyance, telepathy. Here's a crazy one. We don't even think about this because it's so much a part of our entertainment world is vampirism. You think about how many shows and movies have been about vampires in the last decade or more? And you think, wow, how about that? But that's actually listed as a part of occult activity, not from a Christian perspective, which is true from a Christian perspective, but people who practice that say, we're a part of the magic arts, we're a part of the occult. They, they self-affirm that, right? Interesting. Voodoo, numerology, all of this stuff. There's Again, it's not an exhaustive list, but you're like, how do we talk about this? I was telling the team of people this morning in our pre-gathering huddle, you know, you're like, when do you talk about these sorts of things? They're, they're important topics for sure. But the great thing is, is, is the Bible gives us um, a lot of direction in this sort of thing. And so when would we talk about it? Well, we talk about it when the text does. We're just teaching and preaching through the book of Acts. And here we are in Acts 19. And we find uh, what's going on in Ephesus to be something that we can actually identify with in our own culture and go, we got to talk about this because the Bible gives some really clear direction to it, right? And so, uh, and so rather than go into the one side of the camp that just says, oh, it's just kind of phony baloney, it's, it's no big deal, deal, and do we kind of write it off? Because the Bible doesn't do that. And then, but also rather than going to the other side of that to go, oh, maybe... Maybe that's okay. Maybe that's a welcome thing. Maybe I could find some direction or some, you know, get some information, that sort of thing from those avenues. But the Bible addresses that. So we want to land squarely on wh- what the Bible says about these things. So we're going to take an inductive approach to this, which means uh, every time we work through a text, we go through the details, we look at each part, we draw some, some uh, truths and applications from it, and then we, we identify kind of what's the big takeaway. We call it the big idea. What's the big takeaway from this text? What's the one thing, if we, could, if we didn't remember everything else, what's the one thing that we should remember from this text? That's, that, that's our big idea. We'll get to that at the end of the message. So that's our, an inductive approach to this. And so, um, but we do know because of the sandwich tactic that it has to do something with the word of the Lord. It has to do something with the Bible, right, with the, with the gospel, Right? It has to because Luke has purposely given us this sandwich effect in his, in his text. But let's go back to verse 11, verse 11 and 12. And here's the first thing that we're going to see. Kind of the first main idea is that God shows his power in order to validate his word. Right? So Luke's writing about the word of the Lord. And now he's going to tell us about these miracles that were taking place. And he's going to tell us this because it's a validation of the word of God that Paul has been preaching in Ephesus for a couple of years now. So we get this. He, he says, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. 
Now, this is, <laughs> this is interesting because uh, you're like, what do you do with this? Well, the first thing that we do with this is to recognize that it was God that was doing it. Let's never, never forget this opening phrase, God was doing. So, the handkerchiefs weren't doing. The aprons weren't doing. Paul wasn't doing. God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So Paul is a vessel here. Paul's being useful to God. God has chosen to use Paul and do extraordinary miracles through him, but it wasn't Paul who was doing them. God was doing these miracles. And this is like, I just love the language here, because what do you do? Like, if any miracle, by definition, is extraordinary, right? It's why we would call it supernatural. It's not natural. Like if you, if you cut your arm and it's real bad and you go to the doctor and he sews it up and they, they clean it, sew it up, and you put a bandage on it and over the course of six weeks that's all healed up, we could say God did that because God created our bodies to, with those healing properties. And we could say thank God for that, that, that God healed that up. He made my body to do that. But we would call that a natural healing. But if, but if some, you know, if, if some somebody cut their arm and it was really something b- bad, and somebody prayed for them and instantly it was healed, there was no longer, you know, blood and it was not an open wound or anything like that, we would go, whoa, that's not natural. That's supernatural. So, <laughs> so like, why does he call it extraordinary miracles? Because if it's a miracle, it's extraordinary. It's almost, it's almost like Luke wants us to recognize that, if you will, these are super-duper miracles, super-duper natural stuff, right? Because, I mean, this is extraordinary. This is not normal miracle stuff. This is extraordinary stuff. This is, how, this is what God is doing through the Apostle Paul. Now, <laughs> we're... What we recognize here is this is descriptive, not prescriptive, meaning the, apo- the, the, the author here, Luke, he's describing what took place. He's not prescribing for us to do this. Now, do we believe in miracles? Absolutely. Should we pray for them? For sure. Are we going to start a sweaty handkerchief ministry here? No, we're not because we're being told what happened, we're not being told, do this like this. These are, again, Luke's telling, this is extraordinary. It's like, we, we don't even have any indication that Paul is promoting this. There's nothing in this text that tells us Paul's promoting this. He's not like, remember, he's a tent maker by trade, so he's making tents, and he's sweating, and he wipes his brow and sets the, you know, the sweaty handkerchief aside, or his dirty apron, he sets it aside. There's no indication that he set up a booth that's got all of his sweaty hand, handkerchiefs and napkins and aprons and stuff, that he's now saying, hey, if you order today, it's two for one special. You can share them with your cousins. There's nothing in the text that's saying anything like that. We don't even know if he's aware of that, that this is taking place, but there's extraordinary stuff taking place. God, by these these extraordinary miracles, is bringing relief and healing to a lot of people. And it's pretty cool, right? We see this is, this is pretty great. So, and, and it, again, it's similar to, uh, you could look throughout the scriptures and, and, and kind of make a distinction between the, the descriptive and the prescriptive elements of things. There was a time, uh, um, uh, as recorded in Mark's gospel, chapter 8, where Jesus encounters a man who's blind, and for whatever reason, he spits in the man's eyes, and, he, and he, the man is healed. And you're like, that's extraordinary. That's kind of weird. Like, I'm sure he had a reason for that, which we won't get into, but doesn't that, like, if I'm, if I'm blind, it would be worth it to me to have, if somebody could heal me by spitting in my eyes, I would go, okay, let's, let's do it. But by and large, we wouldn't volunteer for that. That's like a weird thing, right? That's not something normal. That's extraordinary. So, so that's just, it's, again, it's descriptive. We're not, we're not starting a spitting in the eyes of blind people's ministry. We're not starting a sweaty handkerchief 
to heal you know, people who are sick ministry. It's just not what, we're, not what we're called to do. God is doing these miracles. He's doing them through Paul. People are sick and they're being healed in extraordinary ways. People are oppressed by evil spirits and they're being liberated in these extraordinary ways. It's spectacular. And these miracles are being done by God right? Again, there's no indication. We don't even know if Paul knew that this was taking place. But these miracles are really, you go, okay, uh, okay, they're extraordinary for sure, but are they, are they in keeping with everything else that's taking place in the ministry of Jesus Christ? And we go, for sure they are. Absolutely are. Th- Jesus did these same miracles. He, look at this verse from, uh, from Matthew's gospel. So in Matthew chapter 8, it says, that evening they brought to him many who brought to Jesus, many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, quote, he took our illnesses and bore our diseases. So Matthew, who's writing this gospel here, the account of the life and ministry of Christ, tells us about a scene where, and this was a normal thing for Jesus, people were oppressed by evil spirits, people were sick, and Jesus would liberate them. Sometimes he would just speak a word, sometimes he would touch them, sometimes he would do other things, and he would bring healing to them. So this is in keeping, what, what's going on here in Acts 19 is in keeping with the ministry of Christ, and, and Matthew tells us that it was a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, and he quotes a, pa- a passage from Isaiah 53, again, grounding it in, in Scripture, grounding it in the word of the Lord. And so we see that this is a very much a part of the ministry of Christ then and through his people as we get into the book of Acts. His followers, Jesus authorized those disciples. He gave them authority over evil spirits. And he, as he sent them out to proclaim the gospel, his, his disciples, he gave them authority over evil spirits. He gave them power to bring healing uh, because God can work through his people in that way. So these super duper natural miracles are being done in order to validate the word of the Lord that Paul is preaching here in Ephesus that's spreading throughout all of Asia Minor. So this is the first thing that we see is that God shows his power in order to validate his word. He has done that, right? And at times he still does that. We have the testimony of scripture that says the gospel that was preached then was validated. And we have it recorded in Scripture. It is authoritative. We have this understanding that of, of the saving power of God, the delivering, liberating power of God. He's proved that. We have that testimony here in Scripture. And can he still do that today? Most definitely. God has not changed. Same God yesterday, today, and forever. So the scene unfolds, and, but then we get this, like, this crazy stuff to, starts to take place. Because the second thing we see is that God's word is not for rent, for personal use. So Paul is, Paul is being used by God to do these extraordinary miracles, and others are witnessing this taking place. Paul is preaching Jesus, and others are seeing and hearing that he's preaching Jesus, and it says that there's some itinerant Jewish exorcists. Like, this is actually a thing, that these, these, these men would travel around, and they would... Um, I would use the word pretend. They would pretend to uh, be able to deliver people from evil spirits. This was something that was very common because the city of Ephesus, because the culture of the day had really um, opened themselves up to all of this spiritual activity that it was very common for people to be very oppressed by demonic spirits and evil spirits and such, right? So, so to the extent that there are people who, who take it upon themselves to be itinerant Jewish exorcists. Like this is a this is really a thing, right? And they and 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 they, it says, undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. So what they were doing before was kind of a continuation of magic arts and the and the occult. They would use certain spells and incantations to try to appease the evil spirits, to try to give these people relief and all of that. And we get the sense that they weren't overly effective. Um, because of what we see take place in this scene. But now they see that there's a... Now, in their minds, they're like, oh, here's a new thing that we can, in, that we can employ that would kind of help with this. We could use the name of Jesus because they're seeing that this is happening. Paul is using the name of Jesus. But, but they don't understand a very, very, 
very, very powerful, necessary spiritual truth that God does not rent His power out for personal use. God does not, we're not to use God for our own ends, for any of our own ends. God is not to be used in that way, right? So they attempt to employ the name of Jesus in their magic formulas, and it says that they, they sought to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus. So this, is, this, is, this word means, bring that def, those definitions up, to cite something or someone as an authority for an action, to invoke, to, ins, to cite someone or something, something or someone as an authority for an action. So you're, you're, they're saying we're we're gonna we're gonna call in the name of Jesus, and by that we're going to make sure that these people are set free from from evil spirits. And to so so their command was you see the quotations. We adjure you, or he says, I adjure you. That means to authoritatively bind a solemn obligation upon someone. But in order to authoritatively bind somebody to something, you have to have the authority to do that. And that's what they didn't have. They thought if they just used the name of Jesus that that would be effective, but God does not rent his power out for personal use. You follow? It's really important for us to understand. To use the name of Jesus, which isn't even really good language, one would have to be fully submitted to Jesus. One would have to be born into the kingdom of which Jesus is Lord. He's Lord of all things, but He's Lord of the kingdom of light. And these men are still in the kingdom of darkness. When Paul wrote to the Colossians and he said, you, you, were, you were transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son, into the kingdom of light. Right? So there's, there's this idea that these guys think that they can use the name of Jesus, invoke and adjure these people, this evil spirit, I should say, authoritatively binding him to, to, to deliver this person, and they don't have the authority to do it. And what's funny is, like even the language in their quotation, I adjure you by the name of Jesus, my guess is Paul didn't say it like that. If Paul used this language, he wouldn't use the word the. He would just say, I adjure you by Jesus. The Jesus is not the way to talk about Jesus. The, you ever hear somebody talk about the Facebook or the Twitter? Yeah, I was on the Facebook. You know, it's, it's just Facebook. It would just be Facebook. It would just be Twitter. You don't have to have that definite article there. Right? So when they say, I adjure you by the Jesus, you can tell they don't know what they're talking about. You can tell they don't have the authority. They're simply trying to use the name that they have not yet submitted to. It's important, right? There's a Luke's telling us this really big stuff. And so th this is the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. And so the approach backfires on him in a really, really big way. It says that seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Siva were doing this. So these seven sons, again, they're part of the itinerant Jewish exorcists. Uh, Siva, uh, he's not the high priest, so this is interesting, right? It's probably, it's, it's probably a, a, a pseudo name, it's a pseudo title that he's given himself because he's the, you know, the Jewish exorcist and they're traveling around. He's, he's like, I'm the high priest. He's not the high priest. We know who the high priest is. He's in Jerusalem, right? He's still actively working in the temple under, the Jude, un, under Judaism. So this guy, is, this is like a, fa a false title that he's given to himself. But these seven sons of Sceva, like picture this. They, they use this, they try to invoke and adjure, and, and it says, but the evil spirit answered them. That would be weird, right? Here's a guy who's oppressed, being controlled by an evil spirit. It's obvious, and they try to use the name of Jesus to set him free. And it doesn't work. The evil spirit speaks back to them and says, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I recognize. But who are you? you imagine? That would be a little bit of a crazy scene, right? It would be like one of those moments where you get a bunch of goose bumps and you realize I'm in over my head. Right? Jesus, I know. How would this, this evil spirit answered him? How would this evil spirit know who Jesus is? Notice, whenever you read the Gospels, the evil spirits always knew who Jesus was. They knew exactly who he was. Right? He's Lord. 
He's the cosmic Lord. He, they know who He is. They know He's the one who's going to ultimately condemn them eternally. They know Jesus. That, that word know, Jesus, I know, it, it's like an experiential knowledge. Like they have, an, they have knowledge, personal knowledge of who Jesus is. These evil spirit, this evil spirit does. And, and then he says, this evil spirit says, and I recognize Paul. Interesting, right? I recognize Paul. In, in other words, Paul had made enough of an impact on the this, on this kingdom of darkness that evil spirits were aware of who he is. <laughs> You're like, wow, that's kind of crazy, right? What, what would that be like? He was enough of a powerhouse of a man of God that the spirits, the evil spirits in the area who were afflicting people were aware of who he was. Jesus I know, and I recognize Paul, and I know this shouldn't be funny, but it kind of is to me. But who are you? Right, here's the seven sons of Siva who, who now are recognizing that they're in way over their heads because the who are you, this is like one of those moments where, right, he says, but who are you? In other words, the, the evil spirit isn't just saying, I don't know you. He isn't just saying, I don't recognize you. He's really saying, it's like, like the heart of the question is, who do you belong to? So what they don't know is they're a part of the kingdom of darkness just like this evil spirit is because they've not been redeemed out of it. They've not been rescued out of it. And so humans by themselves because they're fallen by nature and disconnected from God do not have authority over evil spirits. Evil spirits actually have authority over humans in the kingdom of darkness. Only those who have been redeemed, only those who belong to Jesus Christ have authority over evil spirits and can command them, can adjure them to certain things. So if, if a person does not belong to Jesus, they don't have authority. And this is what the evil spirit is making them aware of. And who are you? Who do you belong to? They don't belong to Jesus, which means this evil spirit, and he proves it, right? Here's what happens. And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them. Now, this is seven against one, so you know this is extraordinary. Seven against one, leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Matt Chandler, um, in, in his in his uh, preaching of this text, said, he's a pastor in Texas, he said that if you go into a fight with your pants on, and when the fight's all over, you don't have your pants on anymore, <laughs> you lost, right? <laughs> Alistair Begg, he, he changed the name of the seven sons of Siva and calls them the seven streakers of Siva. Like, could you imagine this scene? It's so crazy. It's very dramatic, very incredible, right? But it, it shows us very vividly that, you, that we cannot use the name of Jesus for our personal use, right? Not against evil spirits or for anything. What these people tried to use the occult and magic arts for to secure blessing and health and prosperity and deliverance and all of those things, we find a lot of people unfortunately, try to use God for those same things. They're not really submitted to God. They're not really in, they don't really love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. They just want to use God for their own ends. And this is a, a dramatic scene that helps us understand it. God doesn't rent His power out for personal use. The name of Jesus is held in high regard here. Right? The evil spirit was not subject to these men. He taught them a, a real solid life lesson that God's name cannot be used as a magic formula for, to try to get what we want. And humans have no power over evil forces except through a living relationship, a living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, our final scene, no less dramatic as we see how God exploits now the devil's work to multiply his own work. So number three, God's work is accomplished by God's word. Here's what we see. 
So, remember the last, the last passage, last verse tells us that the Word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail. So, everybody's heard it. Now, it's spreading all the more and it's prevailing. Definition of the word prevail is to prove more powerful than the opposing forces. To prove more powerful than the opposing forces in this way. So, in this way, the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail. So, what is recorded in verses 17 through 19 describes how God's word proved more powerful than those opposing forces. The word of the Lord prevailed over the devil's work, and God uses that, that situation, that scene, to enhance His own work as, uh, as we see. So the, so the first, thing that, first thing that happens, it says, and this became known to all the residents of Ephesus. Now, who, who are the, those are all the people who have already heard the word of the Lord. And now this becomes known, and that's why it continued to increase, to, to be more widespread and prevail. Both Jews and Greeks, notice, and fear fell upon them all. Fell upon them all. Fear. This isn't a this isn't like a reverential fear. This is more of a more like terror. The people are recognizing at this moment the people of Ephesus, Jews and Gentiles, not the believers yet. We're going to talk about the believers in a minute. Just just people in general. At this moment, fear fell upon them all. A terror struck their hearts because they became more aware of the reality of demonic power, that it isn't just a notion. Oh, yeah, there's evil in the world. No, no, no. They became aware that it's actually an entity or entities, right? And this terror, this fear came upon them because they recognized the greater reality of God's power. And fear fell upon them all, and it says, the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. So the, so, the, so the name of the Lord Jesus is held in high esteem here. Everybody's heard the word of the Lord. Now, Jesus is no longer talked about in um, non-reverential ways. His name is not being used in slang statements or with profanity. How often do we hear that today, right? People just, they, they just think it's, uh, it's just common vernacular. Well, the people of Ephesus knew better. They learned, a, they learned a, 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 to recognize something very powerful about the name of Jesus, that it, that it is to be held in high regard. And also it says then, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. So they're admitting, now, and, and notice it's believers. They're now believers, so they're young believers. They've, Paul's been there for a couple of years. They're, they're new believers. They've recognized their need for a Savior. They want, they want to be forgiven. They want to have that fresh start. They want to have the, 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 the relationship with God. They want to have the hope of eternal life. They want to be delivered from condemnation. They've received Christ. They're now believers, but, but because it was so much a part of their culture, evidently they, didn't, they hadn't yet been sanctified. They hadn't been set apart from these practices yet. So now recognizing all that this all that took place here, this fear, this reverence settles in. Jesus name is held in high high regard and so people now they realize, oh my goodness, we the believers come confessing, admitting, divulging, disclosing. Not notice, notice there's this is a non-judgmental scene. This is taking place. It's very corporate, it's very public. This is not a private thing. The people are just like, whoa, we didn't realize how bad these things were. We got to get rid of them. So they're confessing, divulging. They understood the dangers now of dabbling in the magic arts, of practicing these things. They realize that their allegiance to Jesus is now, requires a rejection of all of this sort of stuff, that Jesus and this sort of stuff does not mix in any way. And so they're confessing and divulging, and they made a radical break from their past. And it says, that, that a number of those who practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted the value of them and found that it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So, and, 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 and so there's this big fire. There, it's a book-burning thing, right? And, um, and you think, it just looks like, it's just, in our minds, we think it's this chaotic scene. People are grabbing their books from the occultic magic arts, throwing them in the fire. It's not. It's organized. They came together. And it says they even counted the value of them. It's like there's something, 
organized about this where they're confessing, they're coming. Their books are, the, maybe there's a table set up and the, and the Apostle Paul and other church leaders are there and, and, and they're coming and saying, I renounce, I renounce this, I confess this, I divulge this, and here are all my books. And they, writ down, they wrote down the value of those books and they said, okay, thank you. And they, they said, now grab those books and throw them in the fire. And that person who brought them would then go take them and put them in the fire. They're like, this is pretty organized. This is very deliberate. It's not just this hectic scene. Kind of, kind of strange, huh? And, and it's 50,000 pieces of silver. So this is probably a Greek drachma, which uh, a drachma, if you, if by today's standards, would be like 0.119 ounces. 50,000 drachmas would equal almost 6,000 ounces. And I looked it up this week, and an ounce is trading for 15, an ounce of silver trades for $15.14 as of Wednesday. That's $90,000 worth of books. If you divide that by the average cost of a book today, that would be about 6,000 books. This is a serious situation, right? I mean, there's some sort of crazy revival going on here. But think about how many people were engaged in occultic practices. These are all now, it says the believers did this. God was doing something pretty spectacular here, huh? And what we, what we know from the testimony of all of Scripture is that as believers, n- no human being at all should ever practice magic arts in any form, not by way of entertainment, through games, not by way of, not by way of trying to seek knowledge about the future. There shouldn't be a practice of it. There shouldn't be a dabbling in it. There shouldn't be any form of entertainment of it. It's dangerous because there really is such a thing as a dark spiritual world. There really is. There really are evil evil spirits, evil forces that can wreak havoc on people's lives. There really is. And so there isn't a human being alive that should dabble in these things at all ever, but it's completely out of place for somebody who says, Jesus is Lord. If Jesus is Lord, then the rest of this stuff has got to go, right? It's got to be totally forsaken. Deuteronomy, God's speaking to His people, and He says, When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be among, found among you anyone who burns his son or daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a wizard or a necromancer. And you're like, whoa, there's a lot of big words in there. You get the idea, right? Magic arts are off limits. They're forbidden for God's people. When Paul wrote to the Roman church, he said, Romans 16, 19, I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. He said, I don't, you, I don't even want you to know about that stuff. Just be innocent of it. Meaning, not that you shouldn't know it as, as, so you can protect yourself against it, but don't know it by way of actually experiencing it. Be innocent of that. So God's work here is manifold, right? We see, we see a realization of evil. People became very aware of evil and of the power of God. Jesus is esteemed, and the people of God are sanctified. They're set apart for the, for the Word of God, for the, for the gospel. And, and so here's where we get our big idea. Let's wrap this up. You ready for the big idea? God's Word wins. God's Word wins, friends. It spread. It prevailed. It spread. It prevailed against any and all things. People were sick. People were were oppressed. God's word spread. God's word prevailed. God's word wins, friends. His word triumphs over all opposing forces. God's word wins. Amen? So, his power validates his word, but his power is not for rent for personal use. And God's work is accomplished by His Word. His Word is actually at work in us. When we read it, meditate on it, quote it, hear it taught, hear it preached, God's work does the work. God's Word does the work, and His Word wins. Let's pray together. So friends, as we consider application prayerfully, uh, in a few moments, the team's going to lead us in song. We're going to receive the offering But I want us to really drill down here for a moment and be real honest with where we're at. Uh, In a few moments, our elders and our pastors will will, uh, stand and come to the front of the auditorium uh, for people who maybe who want prayer. Um, And so you can prepare yourselves for that. Uh, But just consider what's being taught here this morning. 
the word of the Lord is capable. It will prevail. So let's ensure that it increases. Let's ensure that it continues to spread in our lives, in our community, in our world. Where do you need the Word of God to do its work? The, the believers here in Ephesus, they needed the Word of God to do its work, so they came confessing and divulging their practices. They needed deliverance from that. They needed to be set free from it. And the Word of God won. Where do you need God's work to win? Where do you need God's Word to win? in your life. And ask for the Lord to help you. Call out to Him. Say, Lord, I need you to work in this way. Let your Word do its work. It may have, it may have nothing to do with magic arts or the occult or anything. It may be about a relationship. It may be about a, a habit that you're trying to break. It may, be, it may be about faulty thinking. It may be about, about a sense of of um, your own worth. Let God's Word do its work. It will win, friends. It will win. Any affiliation with the occult or magic arts, that, friends, needs to be renounced. There's, you, there's no room for that in the life of a believer. You've got to get rid of that entirely. Be determined. Be deliberate. Get some trusted Christian friends to help you with that. Any of our pastors or elders would help you with that. Many people today try to use Jesus for their own ends. It's really carnal. It's very selfish. It does not display a genuine love for God. Let that be, let that have no place in our hearts, friends, ever. Let us esteem highly the name of Jesus. And what of miracles? We see that in this text, extraordinary miracles. And I, I kidded, no, we're not going to start some sort of a sweaty handkerchief ministry. But do we believe in healing? Do we believe in deliverance? Do we believe that God can give His people strength when they call on Him? Do you need hope? Do you need refreshing? Do you need God's salvation? All of those things are available when we call upon the name of Jesus in faith. So if you need those things, people will be here to pray with you today. If you need strength, if you need hope, if you need prayer for any particular situation, let's pray together. Let's not keep it to ourselves. Let's, let's call on the Lord together. So I'm going to ask the ushers if they would come. As they come, let me pray. Lord, thank you for all of this word today. It's... Uh, there's a lot here, Lord, but at the end, we recognize ultimately your word wins, and I pray that your word would win in the hearts and lives of your people. We trust you for this, God, in Jesus' name, amen. So, God bless you. And your